Well, I'd like to thank Adam for inviting me uh, here and uh, I've spent two weeks in Australia and I always thought Australia and Canada had a lot in common. Uh, they do and they don't. I experienced 43 degree, weather, 43 degree weather in Sydney and that doesn't happen in Canada. <laughs> but uh, also the Brisbane and the tropics so uh, and spiders this big, I make that up, but they look that big to me. So anyways, I, I, I appreciate being here and uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, today is the uh, one of the proposed research projects that we have, uh, a proposal that we have and submitted to the federal government of Canada. And, and the theme, uh, the basic theme um, having to do with our Aboriginal youth, basically the concern has been um, the levels of uh, poor school performance and high dropout rates. So the solo First Nation in, uh, in British Columbia, it's the biggest we call them First Nations in Canada, um, often because they're treaties that were signed, that they actually have territory and, and, and some form of political control over that. And the Stolo representatives approached me about the issue of the relationship between poor, poor school performance, uh, high dropout rates, and disproportionate involvement of Aboriginal youth in custody. In, in, in Canada, both adult and youth systems. <clears throat> so it's a question that theori theoretically it's been out there. One assumes that if you do poorly in school, the, the problems will compound and you'll end up in, in, um, in antisocial behaviors, violent behaviors, and in Canada that will, you'll end up in youth custody. And as what we'll see across Canada, particularly it varies by province as it does here by state, you get in, in British Columbia, for example, the proportion is between 25 and 30 percent of our, our custody samples, uh, custody kids are Aboriginal. They represent two to five percent of the kids. So it's, it's pretty constant that it's disproportionate. Uh, so the questions have always been historically, theoretically, why? So I'd like to sort of give you some of my ideas and some of the research that we've been doing in Canada. So this uh, is one of the studies that we've been doing and we looked at incarcerated serious violent offenders. Uh, the study that, that, uh, that we've been doing for 12 years in, in British Columbia involves a series of uh, interviews. When they first come in, we interview them and we look at their psychological profiles using the Mackey and Maisie instruments and their family problem profiles. And then. The second series of interviews, we're trying to get a better idea of the probably the most violent personality profile, which is psychopathy. The idea is, can we actually uh, measure this phenomenon in, in adolescence? And, uh, and using another uh, um, instrument, the psychopathy checklist for youth, we've definitely uh, found that profile is there. And then the, also we have an exit interview, and the exit interview is designed to see what has the, what's the impact of custody on their, what is their view, have they, have they learned, as they've been in programs, what have they got out of it that's positive, plus we just simply say what are the negative aspects of custody, how has that affected you, and will it affect your decision to commit crimes in the future, so that's the methodology. The interviews are very, very long, uh, two to three hours. The gender breakdown, as you can see, it's uh, overwhelmingly male, but we have in Canada an increasing phenomena of girl violence. It's gone up, uh, some estimates are as high as 300%. The classic ratio was 10 to 1, historically. Uh, some argue it's down anywhere between 5 to 1 or 3 to 1. So the amount of girl violence has increased. It's still vastly different than, than boys. And obviously the the figure that, uh, that we'll be focusing on is the Aboriginal. In the current sample, it's 32%. The mean age is 16. That follows all the age curve trajectories that are in criminology. <clears throat> so uh, one of the themes that, I, that I've been exploring in, in, with my team, and uh, it's a multidisciplinary team, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, criminologists, health scientists, uh, 
uh, I, I, when you look at the research, it, uh, the argument I'm making is that we don't diagnose trauma sufficiently with the youth, and particularly between the ages of zero and five, because the, the current research on the brain and, and a central nervous system development suggests that trauma has an epigenetic effect. It can actually alter the personality and even possibly the temperament structure of children. And it can go one of two ways with abuse. Often, for, and it's often a gender difference. Uh, for boys, abuse can result in incredibly impulsive, aggressive behaviors, typically. For girls, it can result to withdrawal and self uh, mutilating or self uh, bulimia and anorexia. So that's the sort of the broad, and I'm obviously simplifying it and, 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 and discussing it with you, but um, the point I'm trying to make is I just think we find with the youth in custody particularly high rates of trauma. And if you look over, you can see that. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, 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 as expected, there's, there's differences by gender. And even though the, uh, when you look over at the male figure being low, uh, consistently, uh, the, my researchers have said they think it's vastly underreported. They're embarrassed to report it, but then when you start to look into their files, you see that it's much higher. But nonetheless, it's extremely high. Uh, and then you can also see, as you're coming down, the, 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 the real differences uh, between the two. So the, the key here is when you look at the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. So there right away, I think, we're looking now obviously for, when you look at a multivariate model, this is what comes up. The, you, you see that fact that there's a basic difference there on the, on, on the abuse. Whereas you come over on the physical abuse, the differences are much, much less. So, however, the, again, for, for us from a theoretical perspective, these ages are very, very young, extremely young. So it, it's the same over here. Uh, and uh, again, the, the concern for us is when it comes to treatment interventions, that becomes a critical issue because the, the types of programs we, the, to set up to involve in, in dealing with these issues, one of the problems we have in the Canadian context is, and it's a sort of fascinating sort of dilemma, paradox, by the time you sort of get the data and the files and the case studies done of the kids and diagnostics, uh, you, you may have another two or three months to try and develop a treatment intervention program, then they're released. Because the Canadian law wants to minimize the negative effect of custody. So we try to keep even the most serious violent kids in for the shortest possible periods. But consequently, to develop a treatment program in custody is very, very difficult because once they move to the community, there's nothing you can do. They just simply disappear on you. And you can put a custody order on these kids and they won't, uh, I mean, a, a probation order on them and that means nothing to these kids. For most kids, probation does have meaning, but for what we find in our sample of kids, if you ask them the effect of probation orders, and in Canada, if you violate a probation order, you can't be sent back to custody for that. So the law is pretty strict. And again, unfortunately, one of the unintended effects is kids won't, won't go to treatment because there, there's no... But, but it's a larger issue. I mean, what, we'll, what I'll get into when we look at the rest of the data is I'll make the argument that it's a lifestyle issue. When, when Peter Grabowski, my colleague, and I started, started looking at victimization, Peter before me, what we said there's no point in breaking it down risk factor by risk factor, you have to look at the overall lifestyle, which uh, Hagen McCarthy did in the Mean Street study. You're looking at what is the profile that keeps kids away from treatment? Well, it's the lifestyle they lead puts them back on the streets. In Vancouver, particularly in Victoria, which we call our lower mainland, you can live year-round on the streets because it just simply doesn't get that cold. And there's all sorts of ways, including drug trafficking and sex trade to maintain your lifestyle plus uh, break and enters in property crime can maintain your street lifestyle fairly easily in the, in the Vancouver context. So the substance use profile, again, is for us was somewhat shocking. Um, no surprise on some of the drugs, but if you look at 
ever used, uh, it, it, it's pretty uh, powerful, particularly cocaine, crack cocaine, crystal meth, and heroin. And it, it's, it's quite... And then if you look at, again, the profile that we're most interested in is this one. Because that more argued, you could argue that's a lifestyle profile if you're using it daily. And those figures are high, pretty dramatic. Cocaine, um, crystal meth. Uh, we were really concerned when I was uh, directing uh, the uh, drug addictions with a crystal meth. Uh, um, we thought we were going to get a whole contagion. We didn't. But within this sample, with this type of youth, it is. It's very, and the, uh, the effects are quite dramatic. And uh, if you look down at heroin too, again, the drugs, typically with the kids, we found in our, our addictions research center, they're poly, polymorph, uh, poly users. You're not just using one, you're using a whole whack of them. That's why you'll find marijuana so high. The other thing that's come up in our, in our recent research, uh, uh, the toxicity, or the, not the toxicity, but the, the, the strength of the, the marijuana now, particularly in British Columbia, we, we always joke about it, it's our second biggest industry, it's estimated somewhere between five billion and up. And we grow the best marijuana, I've heard in the Netherlands, and when I, the cafes there, and it's so rich, and my friends who started in the 60s using it versus now, 60s you could smoke 10 of them in a day and you felt okay, now you smoke one big one and you can get uh, um, marijuana and do psychoses from it. And while I joke about it, it is in fact a real serious issue. Uh, colleagues that are working in the emergency intakes in Vancouver, the hospitals, are finding uh, a dramatic increase in, in marijuana and do psychoses. So these are the profiles that are extremely disturbing uh, for us. And then when you look at the onset, again, uh, some of the drugs are very, very young. And obviously, the, the use of, of, of glue, uh, the, the, and again, as in Canada, unfortunately, it's disproportionate in the Aboriginal youth that are, are doing the sniffing. And it's all sorts of sniffing. It's not just glue, it's solvents and gas. And it's, uh, we find now, when you're looking at the epidemiological research, it causes permanent brain damage. And it causes brain damage exactly in the area, the frontal lobes, uh, that are related to impulsivity. And it's impulsivity that leads you to violence and then into our custody cycle. So that's the, the big concern we have. But So this fits this profile that's, that I'm trying to build up for you today. And here you see, it, 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 I think it accentuates my point. Uh, when you're looking at frequent use, uh, it's, you know, you're looking at in some ways, you would argue, because remember, they're poly users. You're looking at, I would say, nearly half of our Aboriginal youth in custody are, are, are using these, these drugs. Now, we use self-report mental health profiles. Uh, so obviously, we have some validity issues here, reliability issues. But nonetheless, uh, what we find is another part, another research. We find that the file data is incredibly incomplete. The ability to track the histories of these youth is very, very hard, particularly among Aboriginal youth because they have a much higher mobility, geographic mobility rates in Canada. There's a, their families are frequently moving from rural reserve to city, to city living to city reserve to rural reserve, and it's a, we call it the churn cycle. A lot of movement. In Canada, one of the unfortunate effects historically is uh, when you're on reserve, uh, the federal government is responsible for services. When you're off reserve, it's the province. So there's movement f to gain resources. The problem, again, in the city context, and now half of Aboriginal families are living in cities in, in Canada. Big, big demographic shift. And uh, I think the, the consequences are both good and bad. On the positive side, it opens up a lot of opportunities in education and jobs for Aboriginal families, but for the Aboriginal youth with these profiles, it can be catastrophic because of the drug trafficking and the concentration of heavy drug use in the big cities. So you get caught up in drug trafficking and drug use.